Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 8677 in the name of Fergus Ewing on stage one of the Forestry and Land Management Scotland Bill. I would ask all members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Fergus Ewing to speak to and move the motion. Yes, uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to open the stage one debate on the Forestry and Land Management Scotland Bill. The framework of this bill will create is key to this government's wider ambitions for forestry to play its role in creating a sustainable, productive and thriving rural economy. The sector as a whole is already worth nearly £1,000 million a year and supports 25,000 full-time equivalent jobs. The bill's measures will also support delivery of planting targets as part of our climate change ambitions and will help us achieve wider social and environmental outcomes. Presiding Officer, forestry is already broadly devolved. Ministers set forest, Scottish forestry strategy and policy and provide funding via the Scottish budget. This bill will complete the devolution of forestry. It will transfer the functions of the forestry commissioners insofar as they relate to Scotland to Scottish ministers and establish a modern legislative framework for the regulation, support and development of forestry in Scotland. Current legislation the Forestry Act 1967 has served the sector well, but it was drafted for post-war circumstances and in turn is based on 1919 legislation. It's time for forestry legislation in Scotland to catch up with modern forestry practice, as well as seeking to deliver improved accountability, transparency and policy alignment the bill places duties on ministers to promote sustainable forestry management, accepted good practice on managing forestry and to set out a long-term strategic vision for the sector via a new Scottish forestry strategy. The bill also enables more effective use of Scotland's publicly owned land. Ministers will be responsible for managing the National Forest Estate to contribute to multiple outcomes ministers will be able to reach voluntary agreements with others to manage land on their behalf. I welcome the Rural Economy and Connectivities Committee's report, which recommends that the Parliament supports the general principles of the bill. And I want to thank members of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee and other parliamentary committees for their careful and thorough scrutiny at stage one. That was, of course, made possible by the thoughtful contributions from many stakeholders who have engaged with the bill process, some of whom I met immediately before coming down to this chamber, uh, which may have made me somewhat late, presiding officer, in which case, of course, I humbly apologize. All of this has been evident in the broad consensus achieved to date, and I hope that that continues through the bill process. That said, the committee makes a number of helpful recommendations and observations in its report. I issued a response to that report on the 3rd of November, uh, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing and listening carefully to all the contributions across the chamber uh, in this debate today, ahead of stage two. The requirement for ministers to prepare and publish a forestry strategy has been widely welcomed. The committee makes recommendations about how that strategy aligns with wider duties and policies, consultation arrangements and review periods. And I will consider all of these recommendations carefully. I acknowledge the views expressed by the committee on the topic of compulsory purchase of land. I give my assurance that I'm listening and will consider the issues fully. Uh, on completing devolution of forestry, I acknowledge that there remains concern uh, about the new organisational structures for forestry. I want to uh, assure members that we are taking a considered approach and will continue to engage with staff and stakeholders as the work to establish the new forestry agency, that's Forestry and Land Scotland, and the dedicated forestry division progresses. As recommended in the committee's report, I will provide a comprehensive statement in due course setting out how we will manage and administer forestry in the future. Of course, some aspects of forestry by their nature require coordination and cooperation across boundaries and borders. These include the commissioning and delivery of forestry research and science, protection of trees from pests and diseases, and agreement on codes and standards for the sustainable management of our forests. 
I'm pleased to announce today that I've agreed with my UK and Welsh counterparts new arrangements for sharing responsibility on these matters. Uh, one government will coordinate delivery of each function on behalf of all three, and in future, the Scottish Government will take the lead on the UK forestry standard, the Woodland Carbon Code, and on forestry economics. Yes, uh, certainly. Fulton McGregor, please. Thank you. Uh, I welcome this announcement and the role that the Scottish Government will play in leading on these key issues. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise on the arrangements that are being made on the future of the Forest Research Agency and which plays a key role across the UK on forestry science and expertise? Cabinet Secretary. Um, yes, it's a, it's a good question. I'm, I'm aware that research is carried out in, in various uh, parts of the United Kingdom on uh, forestry, on, uh, and that is, uh, is a good thing. The, forestry, the Forest Research Agency will remain intact as an agency of the forestry commissioners, ensuring that expertise in forestry, science, statistics, and inventory is maintained. And uh, to enable that to happen, there will be new governance, commissioning, and funding arrangements agreed between the UK and the devolved administrations. And I'm very grateful to my counterparts in the UK that have agreed in principle that these arrangements should take place. And I think they are uh, sensible uh, and to be welcomed. Presenting officer, this bill and its measures will help to underpin our shared national endeavor to expand Scotland's woodland area to secure future timber supply. Growing more timber helps contribute to our wider economic ambitions growing jobs and securing and creating business opportunities in the sawmill and timber processing sectors. The Timber Development Programme is also helping to support the development of innovative wood products and promote greater use of Scottish wood in everything from offices to housing. To help increase the pace and scale of planting, we have increased grant funding for woodland creation by £4 million and provided more attractive grant rates for native woodlands in Highland. Mindful of the impact of timber extraction on communities and the wider environment, we have committed 7.85 million pounds under the Strategic Timber Transport Fund to improve timber transport infrastructure. Our fundamental commitment to maintaining the National Forest Estate sits at the heart of our approach. We are committed to restoring 500 hectares of ancient woodland and establishing 650 hectares of new woodland. This will include work with partners to identify areas of vacant and derelict land for restoration. We want to sustain the productive capacity of the estate, that's three million cubic meters of timber each year. But the estate delivers far more than timber, playing a key role in tourism and leisure all across the country. Each year, the estate welcomes nine million visits. Our tourism partnership, Forest Holidays, goes from strength to strength, and £11.3 million cabin investment at Glen Tress is about to be submitted for planning consent. Local communities are also key to our ambitions. Currently, over 40 local partnerships are involved, including in tourism activity at Lagan, community allotments at Les Mahego and Fort William, and ecotourism on Mull and Skye. Over the last 10 years, 13,000 acres of the National Forest Estate have been transferred to community ownership. Uh, this includes land at Abriachen, Arkeg, and Tinebruch. Through the Community Asset Transfer Scheme, we are aiming to transfer a further 700 acres this year, with the first successful transfer announced just last week on Sky. In closing, Planning Officer, I've set out the purpose behind this bill I've highlighted its key objectives. I've also sought to place the bill and its measures in the wider context of policy and approach to forestry and woodland. I believe we can move forward with this bill's general principles, and I'm keen that we continue to maintain our consensual approach to modernizing the legislative framework for forestry. I will therefore continue to work across this chamber to that end to ensure that this bill becomes law enabling Scotland's forests and woodland to make their full and vibrant contribution to our economy, our environment, and the people of Scotland. I move that the Parliament agrees to the general principles of the Forestry and Land Management Scotland Bill.
Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I call on Edwin Mountain uh, on behalf of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Convener, seven minutes or thereabouts, a generous seven minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And as you say, I'm speaking this afternoon in my capacity as Convener of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Sadly, as time's a bit limited, I cannot cover all of our report. But I do note the Cabinet Secretary's detailed response received last Friday, two working days before this debate. At the outset, I'd like to make it clear that during the evidence sessions, there was a clear message. That message was that it was a recognition of the professional way the staff of the Forestry Commission and Forest Enterprise undertook their work. The committee feel that it is very important that their skills are maintained and not lost, and I note that the Cabinet Secretary in his response agrees. We have heard the Scottish Government proposes to split the functions of the Forestry Commission between a Government division and a new land management agency. While this is out with the scope of the Bill, we heard wide-ranging concerns from stakeholders on this, and the Scottish Government should act to provide re further reassurance to those stakeholders and also to the Committee. The Government needs to articulate how it will manage its forestry responsibilities with much more detail on the creation of the proposed Land Management Agency and how it will work within the Forestry Division. The Scottish Government should also set out how forestry-related skills and expertise will be retained and developed under this new structure. Now, the Committee feels that a clear positive message should be sent to the industry and to forestry staff about the importance of the industry as a whole. We believe a simple way of doing this is by designating the head of the proposed new forestry division as the chief forester. And I note the government will consider this further and we welcome this. Turning to the forest strategy, we acknowledge the importance of this. We recognize that timber production is vital to the rural economy. Forestry is a long-term industry which requires a secure future. It needs a strategy that allows its producers, millers and merchants to be able to invest in the expansion of their industry. The committee therefore feels that the strategy must have the following. First of all, an overarching and high-level objective statement on the face of the bill. This should also include how forestry issues such as land use, planning and community employment, climate change and biodiversity will interact as they clearly need to. A commitment to five yearly reviews of this strategy and a commitment to refresh the strategy every 10 years. And these will need amendments to the bill and we welcome the government's acknowledgement of this in the response they gave the committee. The committee believes that having listened to stakeholders, we also need some clarity when it comes to definitions. In our report, we ask for definitions in the bill of terms such as sustainable forest management and sustainable development. We therefore welcome a government commitment to include definition of these terms within the strategy document. Turning to forestry health and research, as the Cabinet Secretary has said, tree-related diseases don't respect national boundaries, nor should forestry research. The committee recommended that the government bring forward an amendment to the bill to strengthen the provisions relating to tree health and other forestry research from a power to a duty. We also recommended a framework agreement for a united UK approach to forestry research and tree health should be agreed and be in place before the relevant sections of, bill, of the bill come into force. And therefore, I am delighted that we have heard an announcement today from the Cabinet Secretary that that will take this into account. Now, I'd like to turn to an area that caused the committee some difficulties. When it came to the acquisition and compulsory purchase for land, sorry, of land for forestry reasons, we heard that this was a power that had been in the 1967 Act, but had never actually been used. The committee, after considerable deliberation, accepted the need for the retention of compulsory purchase powers to unlock the potential of forestry land. However, the majority of the committee felt that the government had not provided sufficient justification for its proposed extension of compulsory purchase powers to cover sustainable development. The majority of the committee therefore called for the bill to be amended and the government to remove this provision. We note that the government has said they will consider this further and the Cabinet Secretary said today that he is listening to the appeals on this subject and we urge them to do so. 
On the issue of land disposal and forest rationalisation, we recommended that due to the long-term strategic nature of forestry, a commitment to reinvest capital from land sales into capital assets should be set out in the forestry strategy to ensure security and con continuity over time. Whilst the gov government acknowledge our views, they have not offered an undertaking in their, in their response to these views. Now, the committee also questioned the definition of community bodies used in the bill and whether there needs to be a particular section on community bodies when section 17 of the bill allows Scottish ministers to sell, lease or gift land to anyone. The committee called on the Scottish Government to explore this issue further and to determine whether the sections on community bodies are required. On felling, we agreed that a more appropriate definition of felling was required. The committee noted the Scottish Government's reassurance that the felling directions contained in the bill would not be used to force private forestry owners to fell against their wishes. The committee were also of the view that the registration system for forestry operations should be proportionate and cost and resource effective. On finance, the committee seeks reassurance from the government that there will be no reduction in the financial transparency of the new forestry organisation. On cost, we recognise the strength of the current Forestry Commission brand. We recommended that if rebounding excise must occur, that costs be kept to a minimum and that this might be achieved by a rolling approach, for example, only changing branding where vehicles or equipment is replaced. The committee also acknowledged that the current FC Forestry Commission IT system is not fit for purpose and will require an upgrade. While naturally there were some confirm, uh, concerns about government procured IT systems, and we look forward to seeing further detail from the Scottish Government on the exact costings of this. In conclusion, presiding officer, there is much raised in the report, and the committee looks forward to seeing positive action to all our recommendations. Subject to the points that we have raised in the report, the committee recommends to the Parliament that the, the Parliament agrees the general principles of the Bill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Mr Mountain. I call Peter Chapman to open for the Conservatives. Mr Chapman, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I am glad to speak in the debate today, as forestry is a vital part of our rural economy. Scotland's forestry sector currently contributes some £954 million pounds a year to the economy and supports 26,000 jobs. But I believe we can do better. Planting more trees will secure the long-term supply of productive timber, create new jobs in rural areas, help Scotland meet vital climate change targets and reduce timber imports. And given that the UK is the second largest importer of timber in the world, I cannot stress enough that we must do better. That is why I welcome a newly increased planting target, which will rise to 15,000 hectares by 2025. I believe this target is achievable, but we have seen failings on the Scottish Government's part before, as they have missed their 10,000 hectare targets every year since 2001. Now, this 2025 aim will not be met unless the process of applying to plant trees is easier, less expensive, and this forestry bill is fit for purpose. So it is important that the timber we grow is largely the productive timber that our sawmills and the economy needs, as, as too much of what has been planted recently has been amenity woodland. Would Absolutely. John Mason. Uh, I thank the member for giving way. Um, would you also accept that there's maybe been too hard a line between uh, farming land and forestry land and perhaps going forward there need, it needs to be easier to move land between uh, one and the other? Peter Chapman. I certainly agree that, we need, that you know, there's, a, there's a debate to be had. You know, in the past, you, you were either a farmer or a forester and the two didn't go together. And I think we need to try and break down some of these barriers. So accept much of what is, has been said. Given that I've now spoken about agriculture, I need to declare an interest. I didn't think I was going to stray into that, but here we are, we've already done it. So, <laughs> I thought we were on trees, presiding officer, but there we go. Belt and braces is never um, a bad idea in here, Mr. Chapman. Thank you. So, where are we? I've lost my place now. <laughs> 
So it is essential that we work together within the UK to ensure the health of our trees as well. And we need to cooperate to stamp out disease, such as the spread of Lats disease, which I've already spoken about uh, previously. The committee recommends that the Scottish Government should bring forward an amendment to the bill to strengthen, strengthen cross-border provisions relating to tree health and research. And we, we, we would strengthen that from a power to a duty. There must also be no reduction in this Parliament's ability to scrutinise the Scottish Government's performance in meeting targets following the reorganisation. Regular review of progress is important and we expect the Scottish Government to report back to this Parliament on progress made towards meeting the expansion timetable. The Committee recommends the forest strategy is reviewed every five years and refreshed every ten years. The Committee accepts that the current powers of compulsory purchase in the 1967 Act should remain in place for use in only the most exceptional of cases. But the case has not been made for any expansion in these powers. A majority of the Committee believe it would be wrong for Ministers to seek new powers to compulsory purchase land for sustainable development. This poorly defined term would hand huge powers to Ministers, which we do not believe is justifiable. In that, the, at the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee evidence session on the 7th of June, the Scottish Government's own forestry and land management bill team failed to provide clarity on sustainable development in the event of a compulsory purchase order was issued. We have seen vague definitions being used for crucial aspects of legislation before, which create ambiguity and unintentionally raise concerns amongst stakeholders. We need clear definitions in the forest strategy of what sustainable forest management and sustainable development mean. And I do welcome the government's willingness to look at uh, providing more clarity here. The committee welcomes the Scottish government's commitment to bring forward an amendment at stage two to provide a more appropriate de definition of felling. And the committee notes the Scottish government's reassurance that the felling directions contained in the bill would not be used to force private forestry owners to fell against their wishes. The system for registering notices to comply must also always be simple and cost effective. I hope that the reorganisation will be achieved without the taxpayer funding unnecessary and expensive rebranding. I fully support the committee's recommendation that this be rolled out only as vehicle and vehicles and equipment needs to be replaced. It is vital too that estimates of the cost of the new IT system are provided to Parliament at the earliest opportunity. This government has already presided over the CAP IT fiasco, the effects of which are still impacting on rural communities. What safeguards will be in place to ensure there isn't another debacle? Presiding officer, we welcome this bill, but it still requires some more work for it to be fully fit for purpose. We all want to see more afforestation and skilled jobs created in our remote and rural communities. Let's work together to ensure that this becomes a reality and we finally see the renaissance of Scotland's woods and forests for the benefit of generations to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Chapman. I call on Rhoda Grant to open for Labour. Ms Grant, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, this legislation is required to take account of the devolution of the Forestry Commission. However, the status of the new organisation was not a foregone conclusion. The Scottish Government decided not to continue with the Commission, but to take the functions in-house. And while the Bill doesn't deal with this, there's a significant number of concerns surrounding that decision and whether it's the best way forward. I'm glad that the Cabinet Secretary said in his opening remarks that he is given this further um, consideration because there were concerns regarding the loss of expertise um, and that the potential that a new organisation would be staffed by career civil servants as opposed to foresters. If he continues um, with his proposals, then I think it would be useful if he would look to how a foresters could be in the positions of influence in the new body. There was a number of suggestions um, made to the committee. For instance, the creation of a post of chief forester along the lines of chief medical officer that might provide some comfort. 
The role would be that of an advisor to government, but with the freedom to fight the corner of forestry within government. There were also calls for an advisory group representing the industry and communities to be set up in order to ensure that the new organisation stayed close to the forestry sector and the communities it operated in. And this could be a national committee, but with re regional fora um, that could take um, advice from those on the ground. The new organisation also must have an eye to both social and economic impacts of forestry. It needs to be responsive to communities and the needs of the environment, as well as ensuring that forestry flourishes. All these suggestions are working towards keeping the organisation as close to those it serves um, as possible, both in industry and communities. The part of the bill that was most contentious in the committee were the powers of compulsory purchase for sustainable development. The evidence was clear that it was extremely difficult to exercise compulsory purchase and that the whole process required review. However, it was also acknowledged that the possession of these powers would be an incentive for landowners to act in the interests of sustainable development. And because of this, I believe those powers should remain in the bill. At the moment, there are forests that are landlocked and it's impossible to harvest the trees. Some of these have been taken over by local communities who are able to utilise the timber locally. But that doesn't meet the need of, for nation, the national need for timber. So if we are to substantially increase forestry, we must find ways in which land suitable for planting can be made more accessible. And that land tends to be in remote areas where roads are few and where there are roads that are unable to take the strain of heavy traffic when it comes to harvesting. It might be that landowners should work together to set a network of forest tracks through adjacent forestry or land that would enable harvesting. If a landowner was obstructive to that, it could be that the compulsory purchase powers might bring them to the negotiating table. There was other concerns about definitions in the bill. The definition of sustainable development is well used and recognised in other legislation. However, there were concerns regarding the definition of sustainable forest management, which is new to this bill. The Scottish Government made it clear that the definition may change over time and therefore it should not be put on the face of the bill because that would be restrictive. Other options suggested in order to provide clarity were to include a working de definition in the forestry strategy. And my main concern with this would be that it could impact on the definition of sustain sustainable development and that would be detrimental. It would be preferable that the Scottish Government in the strategy highlight the direction of travel to attain sustainable for forest management and therefore deal with any confusion that there may be. There are specific um, provisions in the bill to <coughs> delegate powers to communities and we received evidence that these powers may not be necessary given that the Scottish Government also included the power to delegate their functions to any person or organisation. It's not clear why the additional section on communities is required. Does the Scottish Government envisage circumstances where communities would require additional powers? And if so, what are they? There was also confusion about the, in the bill regarding different types of land. The, term used, the terms used are forestry land and other land, and it was not clear why land held under the bill was defined in this way. Is all land held under the bill to be used for the purpose of sustainable management of forestry? And if not, for what purpose is it held? There, are, there is obviously unplanted land which is owned to promote forestry, for example, for fire breaks, for aesthetic purposes and for environmental reasons. Is this defined as forest land because it's held for the specific reason of supporting forestry or will it be termed other land? We need clarity on those categories of land in order that there is no confusion. There was a unanimous call that the strategy should be widely consulted on um, to have, and to have greater parliamentary scrutiny. Given that so much detail will be in the strategy rather than the bill, we need to get it right. Is it possible that a committee of the parliament could be charged with taking evidence to scrutinise the strategy and report back to the Scottish Government? 
Presiding officer, we welcome the bill on the Cabinet Secretary's agreement to look again at the organisational concerns raised. I hope you will also take on board the positive suggestions we have made to improve the legislation. We support the general principles of the bill. Thank you, Ms Grant. Uh, moving to the open debate, speeches are six minutes, but there is extra time for interventions, which I would encourage. I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by John Scott. Mr Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, the Cabinet Secretary took us back to the origins of the Forestry Commission in the 1919 Bill. And I want to take us uh, 400 years further back. Because forestry is, of course, a strategic material. And when the Great Michael was built by James IV, uh, with, what, with the hull 10 feet thick with Scottish oaks, all the trees of Fife were cleared to build it. And then, as now, we had to import further wood from France and from the Baltic states and from forests across Scotland to build it. So wood has been a strategic material for a very long time indeed. And indeed, Henry VIII, when he saw what James IV had done, uh, concluded that he would build a boat even bigger than the Great Michael, which at 1,000 tonnes was then the biggest boat in the world uh, that was afloat, and he built something even bigger. Flodden uh, cut short the ambitions for the use of the Great Michael. In 1919, of course, we were responding to the strategic imperative to have wood for putting in the trenches of the First World War, where it was clear there was inadequate wood. It was recognised as an important strategic part of military operations. But as Peter Chapman reminded us as well, it's of economic value. It may be but 1% of our gross domestic product, but where that 1% lies, it is very important to communities who look after our forests, who plant them and sustain them, but equally to the forest sawmills that depend on a predictable long-term uh, access uh, to wood. So as in the 1500s, so it is in the 2000s. And indeed, forestry is a very personal thing for many people. One of my late council colleagues, a good friend, Councillor Mitchell Burnett, uh, who knew he was dying uh, from a carcinoma, um, he held on long enough to ensure he got permission from Aberdeen Sir Council uh, for his grave to be on the edge of the forest that he was bequeathing to his daughter. Because forestry is that kind of long-term uh, business uh, that we have to protect the interests of. Now, Sustainable forest management has come up several times already, and I think it is certainly important that whatever we do with land is sustainable. The debate around what sustainable means will mean that it means slightly different things in slightly different contexts. And I think that's why it's proper that it should be not on the face of the bill, but that it should be expressed clearly and unambiguously elsewhere so that we can see what it means, we can discuss and debate and challenge uh, what it uh, might mean. Now, the committee did divide on the matter of compulsory purchase, and indeed it's worth just reminding Parliament that the committees of this Parliament are rather freer from the uh, strictures of the whip system than perhaps other parts of our operation. Um, you know, committees, when they're working well, seek to look at the evidence before them in an objective fashion and the individuals and committees come to conclusions. So the SNP group, because it isn't a group in the committee, uh, divided two on one side of the argument and two on the other side of the argument. Fulton McGregor and I joined Rhoda Grant and John Finney uh, in suggesting uh, that the extension of the compulsory purchase orders, which we might never see used, but who's ex in a minute, who, who, but which I will come in a second, but which the existence of takes people to decisions a little bit faster. Now, Mr. Mountain may come to a different view. Mr. Mountain, sir. Edward Mountain. Uh, no, this isn't a political point. This is just a point that I, I think there may be a member of the committee within your group that you have ignored. I think there are five people in your group, not four. But, but 
uh, as, as you were at the meeting, I'm sure you'll be able to comment on that on reflection. Stuart Stevenson, unlike you to make a factual error. No, 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 presiding officer. I'm, I'm constantly uh, told by, uh, by colleagues and, and even by friends that I'm a larger than life character and I count for one and a half. And thus, when I add Fulton McGregor, to me, that's two and a half out of five. Anyway, no, no, I'm, I, I jest. And of course, Edward Mountain, as our ever diligent convener, is of course correct. And as a mere mathematician, I am arithmetically challenged by his intervention. I accept the challenge. It is entirely uh, correct. Now, I welcome uh, the, the felling uh, definitions uh, attention to felling definitions, I think uh, it, it is certainly important uh, that we, we get that right. Now, it is worth, of course, reminding ourselves that nature fells woods as well. And as it happens where my wife and I as have stayed for the last uh, uh, 14 years, we're surrounded in three sides by about 40 hectares of forest that appears to have been all but abandoned and nature is busily felling what appears to me to be a mature forest. So I think uh, it's important that we see uh, that some of that is addressed uh, as we take the, the bill forward. Um, a, coming to a conclusion, uh, presiding officer, I was delighted to uh, hear the uh, cabinet secretary refer to a Brechen. Uh, I have fond memories of a Brechen. I visited there when I think I was probably about three or four years old in an old uh, American ex-army jeep up to Claude McClellan's croft at the top of a Brechen. It's interesting, at that time it was a very primitive place indeed, very primitive. And I think the community there having the opportunity to take some control uh, over its own destiny will be a way in which it is fundamentally changed uh, since I visited a Brechen, uh, I think in the late 1940s uh, or thereabouts. The important thing in the bill, which I do welcome and others have got mixed views on, is the separation essentially between policy and operation. I think that does lead us uh, to somewhere that's going to be a clearer way of taking things forward. Concluding finally, finally, uh, presiding officer, um, it was my delight to have previously been the minister responsible for the Forestry uh, Commission and in particular to have seen the highly automated sawmill in the Cabinet Secretary's own constituency at Nern, which absolutely illustrates how this industry is a high-tech industry of economic and environmental importance to Scotland. I support what's proposed, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. I call John Scott, to be followed by John Mason. Mr. Scott, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I begin by declaring an interest as a farmer and owner of land on which there is some woodland. So can I begin by welcoming this stage one debate on the Forestry and Land Management Scotland Bill, which transfers the powers and duties of the Forestry Commission in Scotland to Scottish <coughs> ministers. Under devolution in the 1998 Scotland Act, this bill has been on the cards for some time and will wind up the Forestry Commission as a UK cross-border authority and in addition to transferring powers and duties to Scottish ministers, it will also transfer responsibilities and liabilities for staff as well as property. While it will also repeal the 1967 Act in Scotland, it will, however, underpin new cross-border arrangements, as well as create new organisational structures for forestry land management in Scotland. So a lot to do, and it will be very important to get this bill right. Given what a strategic resource our timber has become and is in Scotland, sporting around 26,000 jobs and close on a billion pounds of GVA annually. And Scottish Conservatives welcome much of the bill, but in the time available, it is important to fo focus on what needs to be improved on and where we believe change is necessary. Firstly, as Peter Chapman has said, we are concerned about the lack of clarity over key definitions, particularly the definition of forestry land, sustainable forest man management, sustainable development, the community body and felling. I note and welcome that Fergus Ewing has stated in his letter that he will make amendments at stage two to clarify at least some of these definitions. In addition, we have concerns about the expansion of compulsory purchase powers for sustainable development and the case in my view has not been made by government for expansion of these powers 
And given that the powers in the 1967 Act have lain unused for 50 years, it is less than obvious to me at any rate why these compulsory powers need to be enhanced beyond the provision in the 1967 Act. No, thank you. We also have concerns about community bodies and community empowerment. What constitutes a community body and why there are so many definitions in different bills as to what constitutes a community body. Unlike the 1967 Act, this bill is not as well structured or as easily understood with too much definition of key terms and policy intent left to subsequent ministerial intervention. And presiding officer, this style of creating vague and ambivalent le legislation is regrettably becoming one of the defining features of SNP government in recent years. And I cite as evidence the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015, the Land Reform Scotland Act 2016, and the Burials and Cremation Scotland Act 2016, to name but three. It is simply not good enough for poorly thought out, poorly drafted and defined, and poorly constructed legislation to be laid before Parliament on a regular basis, and it runs the risk of bringing the Parliament into disrepute. Further, presiding officer, we have concerns about the development of yet another new IT system given the as yet unanswered governance questions about the failed CAP payment delivery system as well as the NHS 24 IT system and the failed I6 system for Police Scotland. We also have concerns about the reinvestment of funds generated from selling off the forestry estate and we feel it is important that such income be reinvested into the purchasing of land for further afforestation. Also, while we support the modest expansion of the planting targets, it is vital that provision is made as well for the future harvesting of this crop on new land in terms of the road infrastructure already under enormous pressure in Ayrshire and South West Scotland and indeed elsewhere, as Rhoda Grant mentioned. Also, Cabinet Secretary, industry stakeholders and I would like more information on how cross-border arrangements will be managed after the passage of this bill into law and that information would be welcomed at the earliest possible opportunity, although I think the Minister and the Cabinet Secretary did actually make an announcement in that regard today, which certainly I'm pleased to hear. Another concern highlighted by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee is their concern that this legislation has been introduced in the absence of a full consultation on the development of the Scottish Government policy regarding exemption from the offence of illegal felling and the DPLR committee has recommended that the Scottish Government bring forward amendments to the bill at stage two, which will make provision for exemption from the offence of unauthorised felling. And I welcome, I think there's a consultation now underway in that regard. However, it should have been done before. Further, the DPLR committee also has concerns about the need for clarity on the forestry strategy on how the relevant provisions of the Forestry and Land Management Bill taken in conjunction with the Community Empowerment Act 2015 will apply to forestry and sustainable development in future. So finally, presiding officer, I would want to congratulate the Forestry Commission on its enormous success in the post-war delivery of the timber resource we have in the United Kingdom and note the long-term approach that the Forestry Commission have been able to take and have taken. I hope the Scottish Government will put in place similar structures that will be able to develop a similar long-term developmental view and build on the asset we currently enjoy. The Forestry Commission brand is one of the most successful and trusted brands in the United Kingdom and I hope we in Scotland will be able to continue that good work as we go our own way here in Scotland following the passing of this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Scott. I call John Mason, who followed by Claudia Beamish. Mr Mason, please. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And I think it would be true to say that all of us on the committee, and in fact the vast majority of the people of Scotland, consider that forestry is a very good thing and should certainly be encouraged. We may not have met our plan planting targets in recent years, but as the report says, the details of targets and how we get there do need to be in the strategy rather than in the bill itself. The committee has visited a number of forests and forestry related sites, such as the new forestry pier on Mull. And I have to say, it's extremely good to see an investment in, a, in an asset like that. 
and we have heard evidence in a wider range of issues than the bill itself actually includes. Uh, but this was very useful in emphasising points like we need to take a long-term view of forestry, planting uh, of types of trees needs to be more mixed than it used to be in the past, the processing industry needs stability and certainly long-term planning. And there has perhaps in the past been too hard and fast a line between what land was for forestry and what land was for farming. And maybe going forward, there could be room for interaction and perhaps overlap, making it easier for land users to change the use and even perhaps to have mixed use in some places, which would benefit both the tree planting targets and animals, for example, by giving them shelter in bad weather. On the bill itself, the aim has been to complete devolution of forestry, and we heard that this was broadly welcomed. With so much land in Scotland actually or potentially consisting of forests, it certainly makes sense that this is the sector we should be responsible for here in Scotland. We spent a fair bit of time on definitions, for example, the sustainable forest, forest management and what that meant, and whether it should actually be in the bill. As it says at paragraph 60 of our report, we recommend that the definition should be in the strategy, and the same applies to the term sustainable development, which is used in relation to other land. I have to say that I myself like a bill or an act to have as much of the main content in it as possible. However, I also agree that we do not want to have too much detail in primary legislation where it can become outdated and takes a fair bit of time to change. So I think having these definitions in the forestry strategy seems a pretty, pretty reasonable position that we can all agree on. It quickly became clear to the committee that the definition of felling as being intentionally killing a tree needed improvement, and I'm glad to see that the government agrees with this. On compulsory purchase, it is perhaps not surprising that there were a variety of views on the REC committee. Some of our more right-wing landowning members could perhaps see no place at all for compulsory purchase and felt that the rich and powerful should be allowed to do whatever they wanted. At the other end of the spectrum, some might like to see more public intervention on in how our land is used. However, the majority of the committee felt that there was a place for compulsory purchase broadly in line with the previous arrangements. Now, John Scott did not let me intervene, but he made the point that compulsory purchase legislation has not been used in the past, and certainly on the surface that is the case. But the reality is we do not know how effective it has been because it has always been there in the background when negotiations were taking place. Mr Scott. Thank you. Is this an intervention you yes, made? You didn't you. declare well, what it was. Mr Scott. Well, indeed, thank you for allowing me to make it, and thank you for taking the intervention, sir. Um, it's, it's not on the surface, it's a matter of fact that it hasn't been used. John Mason. Well, it, it hasn't been used in the sense of somebody has not gone to court and gone through the process of compulsory purchase. But if I'm sitting down with you talking about negotiating about our land, uh, then the fact that I have got in the background the power of compulsory purchase can have an impact on the negotiations that we are taking part in. And I think that came up clearly at committee and nobody can actually prove that that did or did not have an effect, but I think we all accepted that it probably did have an effect. Uh, moving on to finance, there were a few issues around finance and the financial memorandum which I would like to touch on. Firstly, a Scottish Environment Link pointed out that as a FCS and FES have separate budgets at present, we see two figures in the Scottish budget each year and these might be reduced to one in future. However, I think we've now had reassurance from the government that it would be their intention to provide more information rather than less after the reorganisation. And obviously it will be up to our committee and the parliament as a whole to hold the government to account on these commitments. Secondly, eh, there will be IT costs and everyone gets nervous whenever IT is mentioned. However, I think it should be pointed out that all governments, local and national, and the private sector have traditionally had problems with IT costs and forecasting exactly what they would be. And obviously that is a challenge, but it's certainly not just a challenge for this place. But we were informed that even without this bill, there would be IT costs because the existing Forestry Commission computer system is not considered fit for purpose. And I note in the government's response that more information will be provided prior to stage three, and that is very welcome. And thirdly, on financial issues, we discussed the whole question of rebranding involving signs, uniforms, vehicles, etc. 
Perhaps unusually for a UK institution, the Forestry Commission has a pretty positive image amongst the public. So understandably, we heard witnesses, including trade unions, say they did not want to lose that positive feeling. Uh, nor did they want to have a lot of money spent on repainting vehicles if that money could be used for actually planting trees. However, at the same time, if we are having a new organisation with a new name, there clearly will have to be some money spent, and it was reassuring to hear that there would be reserves in place so that current spending budgets could be protected. The compromise position, which others have mentioned, which I think the committee has accepted, was that changes could be made over time rather than as one big bang, and perhaps in a similar way to ScotRail rebranding their trains, eh, the Forestry Commission signs, etc., and vehicles can gradually be repainted over time. We've had a number of briefings, and I think I would like to thank other organisations who gave us briefings, specifically from Scottish Wildlife Trust, RSPB, and CONFOR. The first two make points about having biodiversity and native woodland creation specifically in the bill, and many of us would absolutely agree with these principles. I think the question for me being whether A, we would be duplicating what is already stated elsewhere, and B, whether this is better placed in the strategy rather than the bill itself. Please but conclude. I will be interested in the government's thinking on that. A SWT suggests hypothecation of funds, which I'll be That's a not bit concluding. Conclude means thank you very much and sit down. Thank you. I call Claudia Beamish to be followed by Richard Lyle. Ms Beamish, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Our forests and woodlands, as we've heard from many others, are some of our very precious natural resources. And the Forestry and Land Management Bill is important for the future of Scotland for a wide range of reasons. Some of these are the responsibility of the Committee for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform to scrutinise, of which I'm a member. I was thus delighted to be asked by our committee to be the reporter for the bill. I would like to thank the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee and their convener and for the welcome I received at the relevant sessions and my own committee clerks and SPICE for their support through the process of leading to our committee letter uh, to the REC committee for their consideration. I'll be highlighting the main points of our committee letter today and if I have time I will make one or two points of my own. I would like to start by emphasising the importance my committee attaches to the overarching policy objectives of the bill, specifically in relation to forest functions. From our perspective, effective forest management offers the opportunity for multiple environmental and land management benefits. And I quote, we are unclear as to the degree the wider, of the wider policy objectives, including those related to biodiversity, deer management and climate change, and how these are reflected in the bill. And in particular, are being taken into account in the pre preparation of the forest strategy. I note the Scottish Government response states that better alignment will be considered during stage two. And my committee also considers uh, that there is merit in including the need to have regard to biodiversity and deer management requirements on the face of the bill. Uh, I also note that Scottish Government response states that there are a large number of policies, statutory duties and frameworks which are relevant to the economic, environmental and social outcomes of forestry, hence that, I quote, we will consider these matters carefully in order to avoid limiting the scope of the linkages catered for by any amendment. Uh, I think at this stage our committee is still considering an amendment but are happy to be in dialogue about that. I will, I will continue by drawing focus on the term sustainable development, the defin of which, definition of which regularly emerges as an ongoing challenge for legislators. In the previous session of the Parliament, the Racky Committee, of which I was a member, grappled with this term in relation to the Land Reform Act and reached a similar conclusion to that of our present committee. And in our letter we state, we consider that the definition of sustainable development is widely understood and it is unnecessary to include this in the bill. In this context, our letter does stress our view that, I quote, the duties to promote sustainable forest management and sustainable development should also be on every public body and office holder and not just Scottish ministers. And I note the Scottish Government response, which is that um, they will consider this, but I quote that, however, the duty is placed on Scottish ministers in the context of their new functions of forestry regulation, development and support, and these functions rightly sit within one body. And I will take this back to our committee and discuss with them in detail. My committee was unclear as to what the issue or problem with the part three 
provisions in relation to sustainable development are intended to address, the circumstances in which the provisions are intended to be used, and how they will result in the establishment of a land agency, and indeed how this relates to the Scottish Land Commission. In the Scottish Government response, it stated that the purpose of the wider land management powers, those linked to the furthering of sustainable development, is to create more flexibility in the use of the Scottish Minister's land, the National Forest Estate, and enable a wide land management role for the new agency uh, to help manage other land, including publicly owned land in the national interest. This will aid our committee discussions prior to stage two. We regard the acquisition, compulsory purchase and disposal of land clause as a backstop arrangement and recognise its importance as such. However, the bill, as we state, does give Scottish ministers compulsory purchase powers in order to further the achievement of sustainable development for the first time. When questioned, the Scottish Government officials did not provide a rationale for the extension of these powers. A point of order, Mr Mountain. Sorry, uh, just, I, I'm a little bit unclear at this stage, uh, Presiding Officer, if the member is talking about her views or whether she's representing the views of her committee. Because the views that she is representing and saying that are coming from the committee have not been transmitted to the committee that I'm the convener of. And I'd be grateful if you could clarify that. I think that, I'll, let, I'll let Ms Meemish clarify that clarify for herself. That. Thank you, Ms Meemish. Um, uh, with respect, um, through the, the presiding officer, the, the points that I'm making are actually uh, quotes from our letter to the recce committee. And so uh, while I would be happy to um, discuss this afterwards with um, the convener, and, and uh, I've already expressed my... Um, recognition of the welcome I received that I am actually quoting from our letter to, to the Recce Committee. Uh, I, I'll, I'll proceed at this stage. Um, I, and um, in terms of the broad land management purpose of the bill, my committee asked for clarification before stage two in relation to section 13 as, and I quote again, we were concerned that the consultation that informed the bill did not seek views on this. It appears um, that the Scottish Government officials were unable to set out why the powers in Section 30 Management of Land for Further Development were needed um, and in what circumstances these would be used. Um, from the Scottish Government response, I understand that this is in relation to um, uh, the issue of flexibility. In our letter, we make reference to other land and argue that we, I quote, can see no justification for a difference in approach in the bill between national forest land and other land. Um, again, we ask the Scottish Government to reflect on this before stage two. The definition of a community body in section 19 is, in my committee's view, already clearly defined in previous legislation. In this bill, I quote, it differs from the, the definition in previous legislation dealing with similar matters. This could cause confusion on a complex issue. We address this in more detail in our letter and ask Scottish Government to reflect prior to stage two. In relation to the delegation of functions to community bodies, my committee is clear that this bill adds to the community empowerment, uh, is unclear, sorry, how this bill adds to the community empowerment agenda or adds to what is already provided for in the Community Empowerment Act. Uh, and finally, from my committee perspective, tree health is part of our remit and I know this is taken with the utmost seriousness across the Parliament. We emphasise the necessity for, I quote, cross-border cooperation on this, and I was pleased to hear what the Cabinet Secretary said today about the division um, of labour explained um, in his opening remarks. I hope that highlighting the issues raised by our committee in the letter um, to the REC Committee are found to be of value and be pleased to have dialogue with the Scottish Government um, and indeed, in relation to the intervention with the, uh, with the convener of the REC committee. I don't think I've got time to highlight my... No, but that was... Thank you very much, uh, Ms Beamish. I call Richard Lyle to be followed by John Finney. Mr Lyle, please. Thank you, President Officer. Can I begin this afternoon by expressing my pleasure at being able to contribute to today's Stage 1 debate in the Forestry and Land Management Scotland Bill, particularly as the fifth member of the Parliament's Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Here, here. <laughs> Wester represent an area in the central belt of Scotland in Uddingston and Belsill, which, beyond our exceptional Strathclyde Country Park, doesn't always necessarily come to mind when discussing the forestry sector. That said, however, it is a sector which I have, through time in this place, been a champion of as a member of the Rural Affairs Committee. 
It is a particular important part of Scotland's economy and indeed contributing to our vibrancy as a nation. Given the importance that the sector has here in Scotland, I think it's only right that forestry is fully accountable to this place, our Scottish Parliament, and indeed to Scottish ministers. And that is what this bill shall provide. This bill shall provide the accountability, the transparency of legislation, modernise the current legislative framework, and of course enable more effective use of Scotland's publicly owned land, an area which many across this chamber can agree on. And indeed, I'm glad to the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee support the general pr principles of the bill. In particular, I know that the committee heard the majority of stakeholders very much welcomed the opportunity to fully devolve forestry matters to Scotland and recognise the need to update our forestry legislation, which is, of course, as I have mentioned, one of the key pillars of the bill. Devolution of forestry has, of course, been a manifesto commitment of the SNP in our 2011, 2015 and 2016 manifestos and then committed to our 2016-17 programme for government. And as I mentioned this, it leads me to another of the key pillars of the bill, which is uh, the accountability, transparency, policy alignment, which the bill seeks to improve. Presiding officer, this is an important area because there is indeed some confusion around the extent to which forestry is currently devolved at present. At present, Scottish ministers currently depend, uh, determine strategy and policy for forestry in Scotland. But the management of forestry, including of the National Forest Estate, NFE, has since devolution remained with the forestry commissioners. The commissioners are a UK non-ministerial department and currently a cross-border public authority. This bill shall rightly see the transfer of the powers and duties of the forestry commissioners in Scotland to Scottish ministers. Along with it also shall be transferred the responsibility for plant health to Scottish ministers so that the responsibility for all plant health in Scotland will reside in one place. And ultimately, it will fall to Scottish ministers to promote sustainable forest management and publish a forest strategy. Crucially, this bill not only creates a legal duty to promote sustainable forest management, but creates a modernised legislative framework that absolutely supports, regulates and promotes the de development and growth of forestry in Scotland. The bill, I believe, will see a new future for the industry. The final pillar of the bill which I wish to reflect on is the Forestry Land Management Scotland Bill will enable effective use of Scotland's publicly owned land, giving effect to Scottish ministers being responsible for managing the National Forest Estate to deliver economic, social and environmental outcomes. That includes the ability to enter into arrangements to manage other people's land, including public bodies, fulfilling a further manifesto commitment to establish a land management agency. It will also enable ministers to delegate land management functions to community bodies. In the time that I have remaining, presiding officer, and I'll try to be within my seven minutes, I don't want to get cut off. It's I would six wish minutes. To it's six minutes, Mr. Lyle. Six there minutes. you go. Oh, OK. <laughs> I'll keep going. Four, I, four, wish to, I wish to reflect on the additional steps beyond the bill that are required to complete the journey in terms of devolution and indeed a further recognition of the importance of the sector in Scotland beyond which I have stated today. Firstly, I think it's important to state that the bill is not an end point in completing the journey of the devolution of forestry as there should be two further pieces of work once the bill has completed the passage. Indeed, the bill is the first of three principal activities required to complete the devolution of forestry. First piece of work is the passage of the secondary orders under the Scotland Act 1998 in the UK Parliament to wind up the forestry commissioners as a cross-border public authority and make other consequential provisions in light of the bill, thus helping to establish new collaborative cross-border arrangements with the UK and Welsh governments, managed here too by the Forestry Commission and makes arrangements to transfer some of the Forestry Commissioner's property and liabilities to Scottish Ministers. Financial, business and regulatory impacts will be considered as part of development of these orders in line with the standard requirements. The second piece of work is the establishment of a new organisational transfer by transferring to Scottish Government 
the activities presently delivered by the Forestry Commission in Scotland through the Forestry Commission Scotland and Forest Enterprise Scotland. Of course, the Chamber, I am sure, agrees that Scottish forests and woodlands are one of our greatest and indeed our most valuable rural asset, the sector being worth one billion per annum and supporting 26,000 jobs. On every occasion I have spoken in this chamber in the forestry sector, I would like to reiterate that whilst the sector is incredibly important to our economy, it also plays a hugely important part in tackling climate change, projecting, protecting and growing biodiversity, natural floods management, and of course contributes to improvement of general health and wellbeing across Scotland. To conclude, I am delighted the bill is forthcoming will help continue the journey towards the devolution of the forestry sector which will enable us collectively to work together oh, to deliver this important sector and for Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Lyle. Right. <laughs> I call John Finney to be followed by Gail Ross. Mr Finney, please. Thank you, President Officer, and I too welcome this legislation and support the, the principles. Like others, I, I want to thank people for the, the, the briefings. Um, much has been made of the, the number of jobs um, that the forestry supports. 25,000 I have here. I've heard 26,000. If that's 1,000 since I had that briefing, that's great. Um, and an industry worth a billion. Um, and CONFOR um, have significantly said the bill must provide the right assistance. And of course, the right assistance um, is not mutually exclusive work in the industrial aspect of it and also in the environmental aspect of it. So when the Scottish Wildlife Trust talk about uh, Scotland's woodlands not currently realising their full potential, um, and that is in helping Scotland adapt to climate change and talk about more connected riparian woodlands, which could prevent flooding, reduce erosion, improve water quality, allow wildlife to move through the landscape, um, something of growing importance. And as has been said by quite a number of other people, woodlands are an important carbon sink to help mitigate climate change. Now, the issue that we always encounter with legislation is what is and isn't on the face of the bill. And our stage one report talks about the planting targets and a commitment to appropriate levels of reforestation being on the forestry strategy. CONFOR um, seek an amendment to include planting targets in future wood supply way. We've heard that it is a long-term industry and certainly um, part of the um, review period of the strategy is something that, again, is, has been the subject of much discussion. The important thing is that that um, review period includes consultation with all the forestry stakeholders. Um, um, as it's been said, it is a long-term vision. Now, in the particular response to that from the, the, the Cabinet Secretary to that section, there was something that jumped out at me um, uh, in the response, and I quote, for example, there is a known unintended consequence of the current seven-year cycle for the cap that it leads to suppression of woodland creation. Now, we certainly don't want that, and we don't want the uncertainty that Brexit's going to bring. It is long-term assurances that uh, are important to, to um, the industry, and I'm pleased that the, the Scottish Government are going to reflect on the strategy. And I think it's important that it's a living document. Um, and we also know that uh, there's, there's a call for a strengthened commitment to reforestation, and they may be seen as going um, hand in glove. Certainly, the Woodlands um, Scottish Wildlife Trust see it as a an opportunity to increase the quality of Scotland's native woodlands. And forestry is everywhere. We've heard uh, from previous speakers in, uh, with urban constituencies that there's an impact there. And I commend the, the work that goes on in the heart of our cities and across the country from organisations like the Woodland Trust and community groups. Um, it's also good that the Scottish Government acknowledges the interest the stakeholders have in the organisational arrangements and, and are going to provide a statement. Clearly, there's a lot of affection for us, the Forestry Commission. I'm a former employee myself. Uh, my father was, my, my, my uh, father-in-law was as well. Uh, and it's important that these concerns are, are, uh, are recognised. Indeed, we heard that reiterated in the Cabinet Secretary's speech. Um, I certainly know in relation to... Uh, some from the social and environmental sector of forestry, small business people and enterprises, they um, are grateful for the technical support, advice and financial stimulus they've received from Forestry Commission. And in a, a, a communication with me, they express a concern that it will be, and I quote, submerged into Victoria Quay. Um, now, clearly, I don't think anyone... Yes, indeed. Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'd be very happy to give the reassurance that, that that should not happen. And moreover, that recently we extended grant finance to small cabinet makers and joiners who are using uh, Scottish woods and they're delighted to do so. 
John Finney. Thank you. I'm grateful for that assurance from the Cabinet Secretary. And, and I, I should say that, uh, that that communication went on to refer to the Forestry Commission as, as one, uh, a rural success story. And I think that's how I would certainly want to see it. Now, the, um, the, 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 the concerns that do around that are, um, could in part be offset, I think, by a proposal from the committee. And that relates to... Um, the establishment of a chief forester post. That would be entirely consistent with the um, position in relation to chief planner, chief medical officer, chief scientist. And I think it would send a very clear signal about the, the commitment to the profession of, of forestry there. Now, I note that the Scottish Government will consider that, and I hope it will be um, given real um, detailed thought. The definition of sustainable forest management, well, I look what the Scottish Woodland Trust and indeed CONFOR talk about as the, um, the definition that they would go with, and I have to say, they seem identical. It goes on about the stewardship and the use of forest and forest lands in a way, and at a rate that maintains and where appropriately enhances their biodiversity, productivity, regeneration capacity, <laughs> and vitality and their potential to fulfill now and in the future relevant ecological, economic and social functions at local, national and global levels and does not cause damage to other ecosystems. Now, I think that brings us to the, the, what we heard from the Cabinet Secretary about the cross-border and tree health issues. I found that very reassuring. I understand that there's a, a, a letter to the committee about that. Um, passing quickly to the Strategic Timber Transport Fund that was alluded to, well, it's actually cheaper and more environmentally friendly to transport uh, timber to Norboard from Argyll via boats. So I, 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 I would commend that approach. The management of land by, by, by Scottish ministers. I have to say, I didn't share the concerns that many did. It's absolutely right, as my colleague John Mason highlighted, to have a range of options available to people in land negotiations and compulsory purchase is one. And I'm, I, I mean, I'm aware from a previous time as a, a councillor of a ransom strip and people will understand that the public good can't be held back in that. Similarly, with the um, definition uh, of sustainable development, look forward to that, but again, no issues. And as I said, I, I was happily one of the minority. What's on the face of the bill is important. I would like to see our native woodland creation targets in legislation. The, the tie up with sustainable deer management also is important. And something I don't th uh, think many have commented on, that funds raised by disposals from the National Forest Estate should be uh, reinvested. Um, and um, I hope we'll get a long-term commitment from the Scottish Government to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I call Gay Ross, who may or may not be followed by Mike Rumbles. Ms Ross, please. Thank you, President Officer. Um, despite John Mason's apparent surprise, I don't think it came as a surprise to the REC Committee that the Forestry Commission Scotland is held in extremely high regard by its stakeholders, people in the sector, its staff and the public as a whole. Its branding is instantly recognisable and there has rightly been a high level of interest in the current proposals and what they will mean for the industry and the environment. And anyone who has read the report or watched any of the committee sessions will know the high level of scrutiny we've given this, and rightly so. It's a hugely important piece of work that will not only help the Scottish Government achieve its planting targets, but also to diversify the forest estate and contribute to conservation, biodiversity and climate change targets. As John Mason also mentioned, the committee made a visit to Mull, where we heard about forestry on the island. We were also a little bit nervous about midges that day, but as Stuart Stevenson told us, they only fly in speeds of under five miles an hour of wind, so we were lucky there was a little breeze that day. I also went out um, for a day with the Forestry Commission in Sutherland, and we heard hours of evidence here in the Scottish Parliament about this bill. Can I also put down my thanks to all of those who took the time to come into the Parliament and also to submit written evidence and it's great to see so many individuals and organisations that are so passionate about forestry and woodland here in Scotland. I would also like to thank the committee clerks, SPICE, my fellow committee members, and those of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee, particularly Claudia Beamish. Our main objectives for the report were to understand the current functions of the Forestry Commission and Forestry Enterprise Scotland, to find out how these proposals would work under Scottish ministers as proposed and put forward our recommendations to the Scottish Government. And as the Cabinet Secretary laid out in his opening remarks, the bill itself has three main aims. To improve accountability and transparency of legislation, to modernise the current legislative framework and to enable more effective use of Scotland's publicly owned land. 
So just to explain where we are and what is proposed, currently Forestry Commission Scotland provides policy, advice, regulation and grants. And Forestry Enterprise Scotland is an executive agency of the Forestry Commission that manages the National Forest Estate. And the new structure proposes that the Forestry Commission's functions will be carried out by a dedicated forestry division of the Scottish Government, which will be responsible for grants, regulation, support and development. And forestry Enterprise Scotland will become Forestry and Land Scotland, which will still manage the National Forest Estate. Now, I'm pleased to see that the Scottish Government has agreed with several of the recommendations in the Stage 1 report, with several more being given consideration. Agreement has been reached on including an acceptable definition of sustainable forest management and a working definition of sustainable development in the Scottish forestry strategy. Agreement on the integration of the goals of the forestry strategy with the UK forestry standard. Agreement to provide guidance on felling and private forestry owners and to also look at the definition of felling as was mentioned previously. Agreement that registration for notices to comply should be proportionate and cost and resource effective and also that the rebranding costs should be kept as low as possible. And the committee did recommend, as also has been stated previously, that the vehicles, etc., should only really be rebranded as, as when they're needed to be. Um, President Officer, the committee heard from many people about the opportunities this presents, but we also heard a number of concerns, and these must be addressed. The Scottish Government has to allay any concerns that have been brought forward by stakeholders about the new setup giving control to Scottish ministers. And we have heard from the Cabinet Secretary that this will happen. Scottish Government should also give consideration to the post of Chief Forester. And it should also give cast iron guarantees that there will be no loss of expertise or specialisms and give examples of how these will be retained and even developed further. There must be consideration given to a regular review of the forestry strategy at least every five years with a full refresh every 10 years and Parliament must have the opportunity to scrutinise it before it's agreed. Consultation with stakeholders must be thorough and wide. We would like to see an overarching high-level statement of ambition that makes clear that modern forestry strategy and practices will reflect an integrated approach to land use, community interests, planning, biodiversity and the environment. And we all agreed that cross-border working on tree health, disease and forestry science is essential and must continue and be strengthened. And I welcome the announcement from the Cabinet Secretary today. So, for the existing staff and the people in the future that wish to make forestry a career, for the health and expansion of our forest estate and for the well-being of our citizens in both rural and urban areas, given the current climate, getting forestry right has never been more important. The committee supports the general principles of the bill and we ask that Parliament does likewise. Thank you. We <laughs> have Mike Rumbles to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Liberal Democrats support this bill before us today, and it's quite right that we update the legislation surrounding forestry to ensure that we have a thriving and profitable industry. And I'm encouraged by the improved targets for tree planting uh, outlined by the Cabinet Secretary, and I wish him well in actually achieving them, and let's hope that we do over the next few years. Now, as the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee points out in its report to Parliament on this bill, it has made a number of recommendations to improve the bill, which we fully support. I am, of course, a member of the Rural Economy and Connectiv Connectivity Committee, and in the committee, we took a great deal of evidence from stakeholders in our Stage 1 examination. Now, one of the most important areas of concern in the bill has been the issue, as, as raised previously, of separating the functions of the Forestry Commission and the committee has called on the Scottish Government to provide further reassurance with regard to the practical implications of its proposals. And I'm also pleased that the Government's response to the Committee Stage 1 report, the Minister acknowledges this. The other contentious issue in the Bill is that of the whole issue of extending the powers of Scottish Ministers for the compulsory purchase of land. Now, there was real concern expressed to the committee 
that given that the compulsory purchase powers in the 67 Act have never been used, that's never been used. So why is it that ministers wish not only to transfer these powers to the new legislation, but to increase and extend these powers of compulsory purchase? Now, I don't like the idea of Parliament giving up its powers to ministers at the best of times. But to extend further powers of compulsory purchase, which were given to ministers, ministers back in 1967 that have, I'd say for the third time, never been used, seems to me to be bizarre in the extreme. Of course I will, John. John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. I'm grateful for the member taking an intervention on that point. I take it by the member uh, saying used, you mean actually go to court. Would you accept that they have an application short of going to court and it is actually about dispute resolution? Look, whichever, Rumbles. whichever way you look at this, these powers have never been used. I've said it for the fourth time, in case people don't understand that. They have never been used. And I have to say to John Mason that I, for one, am not rich. I don't consider myself powerful, and I'm certainly not a landowner. And I am not a supporter of these unnecessary measures. So I don't know who, who, who John was targeting there. Maybe he was targeting someone else. It's not for me to say but I don't think that is quite right. The evidence to the committee was quite clear on this, and I was pleased when the committee did its job. The committee did its job in a vote, a vote which I'm also pleased to say did not simply divide along party lines, and I think that was really important. It recommended to the government that it should change its mind here. The committee recommended that the powers contained in the 67 Act should be transferred and I wasn't particularly keen to see it, but I certainly agreed the parliamentary report transferred to this new piece of legislation, but that these powers of compulsory purchase should not be extended. Now, I do hope the government actually listens to the committee. I did notice in the minister's response, in his written response, that he has noted it. Well, I, I hope he does more than that and brings forward his own amendments to stage two to reflect this. This is the committee of parliament doing its job. This is what we're here for to do, to take evidence, listen to the evidence, and without partisanship, try to get the best result in this, because we're all in favor of this bill and we want to make it work. Um, so I hope the government recognizes it too, because I also think the bill can be improved in other ways too. I personally would like to see an amendment at stage two to make it clear that the strategic objectives of any land acquisition and disposal should be set out in the Scottish forestry strategy. Otherwise, there is no guarantee or requirement for there to be any strategic plan for acquisition or disposal, and the, and the whims of ministers would rule. I return to the fact that I've always believed that it is wrong to give too much power away to ministers. I made this point to Ross Finney when he was Rural Affairs Minister, bringing legislation forward in the first two parliamentary sessions. And I voted against him. Um, I make this point again. I say this is not because it's a party political point. It is not a party political point. Parliamentarians should be very wary of handing over unrestricted powers to ministers of any political view. And it's not a, I'm not attacking the, the current minister. I'm talking about any minister of any political party. So, in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, this is a good bill and the Liberal Democrats are happy to support it. However, as I've pointed out, there is room for improvement, and we would in, indeed like to see it improved. Thank you. I do have a little bit of time in hand, if anybody wants to take advantage of that with interventions. Not just rambling on for the sake of it, I have to say, with interventions. Uh, I call Fulton McGregor to be followed by Finlay Carson. Thank you, President Officer. Um, Thank you, President Officer. And as a member of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, I support the general principles of the bill. And um, it's been a, an interesting learning curve for myself, um, you know, a background in social work and social science primarily. I've learned a lot through this bill, so I'm grateful to the opportunity uh, for that as well. A strong forestry sector is, of course, important to a vibrant Scotland, and it's important that forestry in Scotland is fully accountable to this Parliament. The Bill makes forestry accountable to Scottish Ministers and the Scottish Parliament and, as I said, it's an important economic sector in Scotland worth a billion pounds annually. 
Now, during the committee, we heard from a range of stakeholders um, that others have mentioned who welcomed the opportunity to fully devolve forestry matters to Scotland and recognise that there is a real need to update the forestry legislation. Um, completing devolution of forestry has been a long-standing commitment of this government. I am pleased that we are now taking steps to complete this process. And by doing so, we will ensure that the economic, social and environmental benefits already delivered by forestry in Scotland are protected and nurtured. And it's safe to say that this government are committed to ensuring that forestry can deliver more in the future, and we hope to provide stability and a long-term plan for the industry. Sustainable forestry is at the heart of this bill, and by putting safeguards in place that ensure our forestry land is being used in a way that promotes sustainable forest management, we are protecting the industry and suitability. This is so important for ensuring our forests provide biodiversity, productivity and regenerational capacity and ultimately ensures there are no damage done to other ecosystems. And this is in line with Forest Europe's protection of forests definition of forest strategy. I also want to comment on the idea of enhancing a sustainable domestic timber sector. We must do so whilst recognising the important contribution that forestry makes to the rural communities across Scotland. And I believe that the creation of the new forestry bill allows us to redefine forestry and ensure our industry is ready for the future. And I believe we will now be able to ensure that any long-term economic impacts and the environmental sustainability of a vital industry in Scotland is safeguarded. President officer, thinking about native woodlands um, are beneficial to, uh, are clear they're beneficial for, for us all. They provide a habitat to a wide range of species. They provide environmental benefits, as others have said, and, and can even act as a social space for us all to enjoy. And woodland habitats can give people the opportunity to interact with wildlife in a natural setting, both in an informal way and in the promotion of more formal activities, such as environmental education. And I even think, you know, myself, I, I, as I've said in the chamber before, I like uh, Monroe climbing and uh, fair weather Monroe climbing, I must add. And, you know, there's nothing better than when you're up and there's, there's a, a forest there as well and the smell of uh, pine. And I know that anybody else who, who, you know, who, who walks through the forest will agree with that. And just at the weekend there, um, I took uh, the family over to uh, Cunaga Loop, which isn't in my constituency, I have to say. I think if my geography is right, it will be Clare Hoggies. If not, I apologise to the member. Is it? It is. Thank you, John. Um, and uh, it's a fantastic uh, facility as well. And going back to my own constituency, I recently met with uh, Charles Dundas from the Woodland Trust and uh, had a walk around Rampelier Country Park in my constituency. And I wasn't actually aware prior to that, that uh, there's actually some ancient woodland there. Um, so I'm quite proud of that fact now. 1% um, of Scotland is covered in ancient woodland. And uh, I've, uh, as I said, I've found out now that uh, some is in my constituency. So that's, um, that's really good. Um, and al also something that we spoke about uh, during that particular walk was the deer management uh, issue, which is something that's been raised by the Scottish Wildlife Trust as well as others. Um, and I probably would be, be worth saying it's not the only time I've had uh, contact with the Trust on constituency matters. Just recently I've been involved with a community dispute, dispute where uh, a local company have actually went in and, and cut down a number of trees which have been in place for over 20 years and without notice or consultation uh, to residents. And uh, Residents considered these trees as part of their home and uh, although it wouldn't be appropriate for here in the Chamber to get into more details of that particular case, I think it does highlight the need for uh, some of the community involvement aspects that we took evidence on in the bill. Um, woodlands are, as I said, a natural deer habitats, and the creation of a new woodland uh, would ensure deer have suitable habitats and allow them to colonise in appropriate areas. And I would be, as John Finney said, inclined to consider the trust response. It sets out that all owners and managers of private forest and woodland have a responsibility to ensure that arrangements are in place to manage the deers. Um, President officer, I, I, I welcome the Scottish Government um, recognising some of the concerns expressed by stakeholders um, as set out by the Minister. The Scottish Government acknowledged the importance of retaining local office networks and sustaining opportunities for interchange between agency and division. This in response to concerns about a potential loss of expertise and skills. Um, the issue of skills retention is a focus of the new agency and new division projects under the recently established forestry devolution programme. Um, and the projects will be identifying ways to continue to recognise the value and value engagement with the professional bodies and identify jobs requiring specific professional qualifications. Presiding officer, can I just touch briefly on the issue of community uh, of compulsory purchase orders? Um, I, I 
I'm, not, I'm going to get involved in a, a mass dispute here, but I believe then it was, I was 33% of the SNP team, with Stuart Stevenson accounting for the other 66% uh, SNP members who, um, who were, a, were a, a minority of the committee. Um, my view on that is to... Uh, yes, have I got time? Yes, yep. certainly. Okay. David Stewart. Confirming if it was SNP policy that Stuart Stevenson counted as one and a half members, as he testified earlier. I, I, couldn't Fulton McGregor. I couldn't possibly comment on that, um, but it certainly he, he managed to dig himself out a hole earlier with his uh, one and a half um, uh, members. But, but what I did want to say on a serious note uh, about compulsory purchase orders is um, why I mentioned uh, my previous experience in social work at the start. As the CPO, whenever we were using the term, it just reminded me of a, a child protection order, because that's obviously what, what we refer to it as. And actually, John Finney's point about the legal status is very, very important. Actually, a child protection order is rarely used and accessed. And actually, it's probably not too uh, extreme to imagine a day where we would not, where we would not uh, need there's it. There's no I'm, time I'm, left, I'm Mr. Rumpus. I'm going to develop the point anyway, so um, where we would not, we would not actually need it, but it wouldn't. You wouldn't want it not to be there, and you and also when a, when a process goes through, like a child protection process or a or another process goes through, the, it's, it works on the basis that that is in place and that could possibly be. So I, I will leave it at that point, and and um, I'm coming to the end. Uh, no, I think I you're at the end. About failing, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. McGregor. Uh, can I have Finlay Carson to be followed by Colin Smith, please? Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I welcome the announcements made by the Cabinet Secretary. However, we in these benches are not alone in holding serious concerns about the current bill before Parliament. Scottish Land and Estate stated they have major concerns with the government's current proposals and that the bill was poorly constructed in contrast to the Forestry Act 1967. Bidwells have highlighted their disquiet over the proposals to strengthen and broaden Scottish ministerial powers of compulsory purchase. The Institute of Chartered Foresters consider that significant amendments are required. The National Farmers, Farmers Union of Scotland highlight the bill's potential for undermining relations between farming and forestry. Furthermore, the Community Woodlands Association also seeks greater, greater clarity over a number of definitions within the bill. And I'm glad to find myself within the company of many reputable and knowledgeable stakeholders in highlighting my concerns with the bill in its current form. There are two areas of significant concern within this bill. The lack of clarity over key definitions and the expansion of compulsory purchasing powers. The Oxford Dictionary clearly defines clarity as the quality of being clear and intelligible. Yet this bill currently fails to provide a clear and, and intelligible definition of forestry land, sustainable forest management, sustainable development and community body. Once again, legislation brought before this parliament lacks clarity. We've witnessed this during stage one of the, animal, the Wild Animals and Travelling Circuses Bill, where vague definitions were applied to wild animals and travelling circus. During the Rural Economy and Connectivities Committee evidence session on the 7th of June, the Scottish Government's Forestry and Land Management Bill team couldn't provide further reassurance as to how compulsory purchase could further the achievements of sustainable development. Key definitions within the bill have worryingly been left to the discretion of ministerial interpretation. In order to provide the transparency and confidence that the forestry sector requires, the ministers must ensure that these definitions are given further clarity if the bill is to move forward to the next stage. However, I'm glad that the Cabinet Secretary in his letter to the committee convener, Edward Mountain, has indicated that he will review certain measures within the bill, namely surrounding vague and unclear definitions. Presiding officer, I believe that an expansion of the existing compulsory purchase power is not required. The current powers found under the Forestry Act 1967 have not scarcely been used, but have never been used by Scottish ministers. A further enhancement of these powers would only reaffirm the mantra of this SNP government and see further unnecessary centralisation of power. The use of compulsory powers have also been raised recently in the discussion paper published by the Scottish Law Commission, which noted the peculiar disturbing circumstances of losing property under a statutory process, and went further to state 
it is of the highest importance that, as it affects ordinary people, the legislation should be as clear as possible. Stakeholders are also concerned with the use of compulsory purchase. The NFUS is sceptical that the two fundamental principles of valuations for compulsory purchase would be, needs to be consistent and rigorously abided by. That's that the seller and the purchaser are both willing and that the seller is no better or worse off. We have seen this already happen through what some people see as the mishandling of the compulsory purchase orders along the route of the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route. I therefore believe that the compulsory purchase powers under this Act are at best unnecessary and at worst a power grab by the government. Presiding officer, I do welcome aspects of the bill, namely that a routine review of a forestry strategy and the strengthening provisions related to tree health, which I believe will be beneficial to my constituency of Galloway and Western Vries, where as everybody knows we are campaigning to establish Scotland's next national park, which would take in the whole of Galloway Forest Park. However, in order for this bill to pro provide the action it seeks to undertake, fundamental changes must be made to the bill in its current form. I call Colin Smith to be followed by uh, a forgotten Angus MacDonald. <laughs> Th thank you very much, President Officer. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to take part in a debate on legislation that will have a, a major impact on an important sector within my South Scotland region. As we've already heard, forestry plays an invaluable role in many aspects of Scottish life, contributing to climate change mitigation, biodiversity, flood management, health and wellbeing, and of course, tourism. It's estimated that the sector supports around 25,000 full-time equivalent jobs across Scotland and 954 million of gross value added. And it's, it's particularly important to rural economies. My own home region of Dumfries and Galloway has one of the highest concentrations of forestry in the country, with woods and forests covering some 31% of the land. The 211,000 hectares range from the, the great spruce forest of Galloway and Estill Muir through the traditional estate forests, such as those of Buclue Estates, to the small native and farm woodlands that are so important to the beautiful landscape of Dumfries and Galloway. Not surprisingly, the region is a major timber producing area, harvesting some 30% of Scotland's homegrown timber each year, and it's home to Scotland's largest biomass power station. The timber industry is responsible for more than 3,000 jobs in Dumfries and Galloway, many of which are in remote rural areas. It's therefore an economic and environmental imperative that this bill adequately supports the forestry sector and the associated industries. I'm happy to support the general principles of the bill today and I welcome the bill's broad aims. In addition to the need to fully devolve forestry powers, I support the need to promote accountability, transparency and policy alignment in this area. Likewise, any endeavours to modernise the sector and improve the effectiveness of how we use Scotland's publicly owned land is very much welcome. However, there is more to be done to ensure that the bill fully supports these aims, and I commend the work done by both the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee and the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee in scrutinising the bill. It's important to acknowledge that many aspects of forestry interrelate closely with other policy areas, and I hope the government will accept the committee's calls for the development of, and I quote, an overarching high-level statement of ambition on the face of the bill that makes clear that modern forestry strategy and practices will reflect an integrated approach to land use, community interests and the environment. President officer, I appreciate the need for full devolution of forestry matters. However, it's important that the existing engagement between stakeholders from communities and local authorities are not compromised in the process. Bringing the management of the forestry estate into the Scottish Government's remit does risk the potential for over-centralisation, which frankly has been a habit of government in recent years, and we must be careful to guard against this. Local forest districts and their outreach functions play a crucial role, and it's vital that the new structure reflects this role. In Dumfries and Galloway, the estate is governed by two forest districts, Galloway District and Dumfries and Borders Districts, which between them cover 171,000 hectares. In addition to the production role, the current arrangements have played a crucial part in developing the wider health and recreational benefits of forests in the area from the development of the Seven Stain Cycling Project to the Scottish Dark Sky Observatory in Galloway Forest Park, which hopefully, <coughs> given time, will become a Galloway National Park. So it's vital that, vital that we maintain the role carried out by forest districts in any new structures. This bill will also bring into force the proposed restructuring of for the Forestry Commission. 
The plans as, as they stand have failed to win support. Indeed, the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee noted, and I quote, wide-ranging concerns expressed by stakeholders at the separation of the functions of the Forestry Commission. In particular, I'd highlight concerns that the scope, focus and resources of the Forestry Division may be diluted over time and the separation of the division and the Commission may result in a loss of professional forestry expertise. This bill and the discussions around it provide an opportunity to examine these issues and to work to address concerns on the matter. I welcome the Scottish Government's announcement that they will produce a statement setting out how it will manage and administer its forestry responsibilities and the relationship between the Forestry Division and the agency. It's essential that this provides assurances on these, these issues and clarifies what will be done to ensure that the separation of the Commission's functions will not weaken the, local, the total capacity of the two organisations. Likewise, I'm glad that the Scottish Government is considering the Committee's recommendation that significant changes to the arrangement set out in the statement must be notified to Parliament and be subject to further consideration. The introduction of a statutory requirement for a Scottish Government forestry strategy based on sustainable forest management is also a welcome change and I'm glad that the Scottish Government have agreed to the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee's recommendation that a working definition of the term sustainable forest management is given in order to provide clarity on what exactly is expected. I also welcome calls to include a statutory process to ensure regular revision and the review of the forestry strategy is undertaken. I appreciate there's a balance to be struck between providing flexibility and certainty, but the committee's recommendation for the strategy to be reviewed every five years and refreshed every 10 years seems a reasonable one. Another key concern raised in submissions to the committee was on the topic of devolution and its impact on research capabilities and scientific expertise. The South of Scotland Regional Forestry Forum highlighted this issue, stating, and I quote, it's essential that Britain's current forest research capability is not lost and that discussions on a cross-border approach to forest research reach a successful conclusion. Likewise, the National Trust for Scotland asked for clarification on how cross-border cooperation will develop. And indeed, the committee's report noted the widespread view that, and I quote again, the research functions of the current UK-wide Forestry Commission are crucial to the continuing health of Scotland's forests. This is a crucial point so, to take into consideration during the devolution process. So, President Officer, I welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to provide regular updates on the progress of its discussions with the rest of the UK on this issue, and I'm glad they've recognised the importance of an appropriate framework for cross-border research is in place before the bill comes into place. There is still, however, a lack of clarity over the purposes of the compulsory purchase orders that purchase powers conferred by the bill, in particular provision relating to sustainable development. The current widespread lack of confidence in this aspect of the bill has to be addressed if the Scottish Government are to take this particular provision forward, no matter the support that exists there. President officer, the full devolution of forestry powers is a valuable opportunity to improve our approach to the sector, a sector of such importance to thousands of my constituents. There is significant scope for progress here, and for that reason, I'm happy to support the general principles of this bill. However, the bill as it stands does require work to be done before it is fit for purpose. And I'm glad the Scottish Government have already agreed to a number of the committee's recommendations and I'd urge them to give further consideration to the other points raised here today and by stakeholders across Scotland. Thank you. Before I call Mr Macdonald, can, can I remind all parties in this chamber that no front bench should ever be left empty during a debate? And I would ask all parties represented to take note of that for future reference. Thank you. Now, I have Angus Macdonald, please, to be followed by Tom Mason. Yeah, thank you, uh, President Officer. Following on from the successful transfer of the Crown Estate to Crown Estate Scotland, with Scottish ministers now responsible for all Crown Estate assets in Scotland and with all revenue profit going to the Scottish Government, we now see, through this bill, forestry being made fully accountable to Scottish ministers and the Scottish Parliament. And I have to say, it's always struck me in the past that not having forestry matters fully devolved to Scotland has been messy, eh, to say the least. Eh, so I'm glad to see it being tidied up, eh, albeit with continuous, uh, continued cross-border working on tree health and other matters. So there's no doubt that uh, a strong forestry sector uh, worth, as we've already heard, £1 billion annually is important to a vibrant Scotland and it's also vitally important that forestry in Scotland is fully accountable to this Parliament. So, President Officer, I hope to cover three main strands in my contribution today. Uh, woodland deer management, sustainable forest management and biodiversity. Now, we know from the, the work the former Raki Committee did on deer management and more recently the Clare Committee 
since its formation last year that there are too many deer in Scotland. According to the Scottish Wildlife Trust, and I thank them for the, the briefing they provided uh, in advance of today's debate, uh, using estimates of deer populations in Scotland's forests, there are around 85,000 to 100,000 roe, sika and fallow deer in privately owned Scottish forests, and 40 to 45,000 in the National Forest Estate. And red deer estimates in private forests are between 45,000 to 60,000, and on the National Forest Estate, the figure is between 40 uh, to 45,000. Now, we also know that 30% of all deer culling in Scotland has been carried out by the Forestry Commission or Forestry, uh, Forest Enterprise Scotland in the National Forest Estate, which unbelievably cost the taxpayer over £3 million per year. And that's not including the cost of deer fences, which is another story that uh, we'll not go into uh, today. Um, but this is clearly disproportionate, given the National Forest Estate covers only 6% of the land area. So with the creating of new woodland, which this bill will clearly enable, we'll also see the creation of new deer habitats. And it should therefore go without saying that it's, it's surely the responsibility of all owners and managers of private forests and woodland to manage the deer that live in their patch. And that includes killing, um, as Fulton McGregor and John Finney have already alluded to. Yes, briefly. Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you. I thank the member for taking the intervention. When you are submitting uh, applications for new woodland grant schemes, a part of the process is deer management, and deer management has to be considered. So surely what you're asking for is already happen, happening, either considering it. It's just a question of implementing it. Would you agree? Angus MacDonald. Well, implementation is, is the key, absolutely. Um, but such action, uh, as I've suggested, would clearly uh, help the timber crop, improve the woodland's biodiversity, and significantly reduce the impacts of deer grazing on nearby agricultural crops. And of course, reduce the risk of road traffic collisions with deer, which uh, some of us have, have experienced. So, President Officer, given the uh, unexpected knowledge that I've gained on the issue of deer management through serving on the former Raki Committee in the previous session of Parliament for four years, and the current Declare Committee, I have to say I have a lot of sympathy for uh, and fully understand the, the Scottish Wildlife Trust's call that there should be a legal requirement for forest owners to take adequate and appropriate steps to manage and control deer. So I would suggest that as a strong argument for SWT's assertion that the bill should be amended to incorporate a duty of sustainable deer management for all forest owners. Having a plan in place to manage deer would clearly reduce the damaging impacts that deer can have and would also create economic opportunities through the letting of deer stocking and the resultant venison sales. And this would tie in well with our calls in the 2016 uh, report on deer management uh, by the Eclair Committee. Now, um, turning to the issue of biodiversity and the sustainable forest management, I'm pleased to note that whilst the bill in its current form does not define sustainable forest management, the policy me memorandum uses the widely accepted definition from the 93 Pan-European Ministerial Conference on the Protection of Forests in Europe. However, I understand that the government has accepted the committee's recommendation that for as long as sustainable forest management is the goal, the accepted definition should be included in the forest strategy, which is welcomed. And the definition fits well with the requirement for Scottish ministers to set out their objective um, priorities and policies with respect to the promotion of sustainable forest management. But can I, can I just add, um, with regard to the issue of um, compulsory purchase orders, a uh, compulsory purchase order power has been extended to include sustainable development. Um, I'm pleased the Cabinet Secretary has indicated in his opening remarks that he's, listening, he's in listening mode on this issue. However, I have to say, um, with my uh, family having been subjected to CPOs in the past, I, I can testify to the fact uh, that the threat of them does help to concentrate minds, whether you, whether you like them or not. So, um, you know, uh, uh, we, we have experience of that. Anyway, uh, turning back to um, uh, biodiversity, uh, before my time runs out, it must remain on the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament's radar. Uh, I note the RSPB's request for the in their briefing that uh, biodiversity should be given more distinct recognition in the bill, in addition to other environmental considerations such as flood water management and carbon sequestration. They also suggest the bill should be amended to include a duty to develop a statutory method of assessing sustainable forest management, which 
seems to me to be a reasonable request, and I look forward to a uh, possible consideration of that at stages two and possibly three. So in closing, presiding officer, the creation of this new bill redefines forestry in Scotland for the 21st century, ensuring the long-term economic and environment, environmental sustainability of this vital industry. I welcome the devolution of forestry to Scottish ministers and the fact that forestry will be fully accountable to this parliament is, in my view, long overdue. Another step in the right direction, President Officer. The last of the open debate speakers is Tom Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Scotland's land and forests are virtually are vitally important resources for so many in our country. I myself have observed Asic forests up near Nairn develop over at least one cycle, if not into the second cycle. And I would be at a loss to find it not sustainable. And I actually believe I understood from the foresters that it was the only sustainable forest in Scotland. As such, it is, it is incumbent on us to be responsible in, a, in how we legislate for them and focused on putting in place the best practice to benefit Scotland as a whole. The forestry sector alone is worth almost a billion pounds per, per year in the economy, supporting more than 26,000 jobs, and of course the families that rely on them. It is also important to consider environmental concerns. Continued afforestation is for undoubted relevance when trying to limit levels of CO2 in the atmosphere. Unfortunately, this, beer, this bill bears a number of similarities with many others that have come before this Parliament, not least of all the Wild Animal Circus Act. While well intentioned for the most part, but poorly written, the vague and vague to the extent that the fundamental aims of the bill are lacking substantive clarity. I've read the Cabinet Secretary's letter to Edmund Mountain, and given that he had the, the Rex recommendation for almost a month, it was regrettable to see that his response snuck out on Friday afternoon before this debate. I myself missed it since I was occupied over the weekend. And whilst the Cabinet Secretary has said he might consider some issues for a member, I believe the government should be much clearer much sooner. One such example is how we define sustainable forest management. This should be simple. However, the Scottish Government's key forestry bill did not even think to define it, forcing concessions from the Cabinet Secretary before it even made stage one. It is important to have strict definitions where ministers wish to grant themselves sweeping new powers to adjudicate on these matters. Otherwise, we risk a situation where the government can hide poor performance and implementation behind vague terms of reference. I would simply, this is simply not good enough. I urge ministers to take them on amendments in this area. With this in mind, I have real concerns with the expansion of the compulsory purchase powers this bill would give ministers. And this has been mentioned quite often already. My apologies. I apologise that. For example, it was not long ago that the SNP were cheering on such orders to facilitate Donald Trump's Balmini vanity project. But I know that didn't exactly go well. In addition, the Scottish Government is totally inexperienced with making compulsory purchases for the purpose of sustainable development. It's made now. There are currently no examples of Scottish ministers using the powers of compulsory purchase in the context of forestry. Of course, they probably need to figure out what it all means first. Yes, if you wish. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just for clarity, the Scottish Government and indeed local authorities are very experienced in making compulsory purchase orders uh, in general. And I can't imagine that the purpose being for sustainable development will make the process in any material way much different. Tom Mason. All situations have their own, all situations have their own, own competence. And if they haven't experienced the forestry one, then they will not be competent to do so. I really do recommend the ministers think again and consider whether or not these provisions are really necessary. I'm also worried about the requirement for the totally new IT system. Royal Scotland is still paying for the Scottish Government's incompetence in this, in this area. Although I suspect the Cabinet Secretary was hoping we'd all forget about that. I share the concerns of my Conservative colleagues, co colleagues 
have raised in relation to defining of a community body and section 17 proposals to sell, gift, lease or gift of land to anyone ministers feel fit. I know the Cabinet Secretary has agreed to explore potential need for amendments here, but it should be a serious error of judgment were these to fall by the wayside. We on this side of the chamber would prefer to see any funds raised from the sale of forestry land, sale of forestry land reinvested in continuous afforestation rather than grants. I hope the Scottish Government will take this on board. Presiding officer, this bill will have profound effects on our rural economy. However, the drafting of it is simply not up to the required level. The bill also fails to strike correct balances in many areas. It goes too far with compulsive purchase powers and the IT system, but not far enough when it comes to reinvesting in, in forestation for the future. There is much still to do with the bill. I hope Minister will take these legitimate concerns on board and not remain blinkered in their approach to rural Scotland. We are, while I support the bill in general terms, I do ask that these amendments be allowed to go through. Thank you. We now move to the closing speeches, and I call David Stewart. Around six minutes, please, Mr Stewart. <clears throat> uh, thank you, uh, President Officer. Um, in 1918, in the dying days of the First World War, the country was ravaged by conflict, our young people had been sacrificed on the battlefield, and our economy was in freefall. That was the context in which the Forestry Commission was born, with the aim of replanting, rebuilding, and renewing a crucial asset that appeared impossible to replace. Of course, the idea seemed oxymoronic. How could we replace native Caledonian pine forests that were hundreds of years old? However, in the 1920s and 1930s, these foresters of old did what was said on the tin. They replanted our forests with fast-growing and mainly, though not exclusively, non-native species. And we all know the picture is very different today. Our living forests play a number of roles in climate change mitigation, industry and construction, job creation, biomass, housing, leisure and biodiversity. That is why the debate is so important today. The new bill, as we've heard, includes devolving forestry to Scottish ministers, and it's my hope that this will offer the opportunity to better integrate forestry with other rural land uses in Scotland. We must recognise the important economic benefits from forestry. So often it's rural areas which are the most vulnerable, and as a Highlands and Islands MSP, this is very close to my heart. But forestry offers us much more as well. As other members have said, it, looks, it provides leisure spaces, carbon sequestration, flood mitigation, erosion reduction, water quality improvement, timber protection, and a biodiverse habitat for many of our native species. Many of our native woodlands provide a home for at-risk species in Scotland whose population has been in decline. So it's not just the area of forestry we need to improve, but the quality as well. So increased tree planting for the sake of it is not enough. It must be in the right area and the right tree species or it could do more harm than good. In their excellent briefing, ISPB make the point that biodiversity and environmental benefits are not always fully interlinked and they must be kept separate in order to support both. This is true of both rural and urban areas and the word forestry brings to mind acres and acres of trees but it does not cover tree planting in urban areas which is very important in terms of increasing green spaces which of course can help mental and physical health of local communities. And whilst the powers are moving to Scottish ministers, it's vitally important that the skills and knowledge of the current Forestry Commission staff are maintained. The very nature of forestry involves long-term planning, and many of our man-made ancient forests only exists because of the forward thinking of our forebearers. And as the uh, Greek proverb goes, a society goes great when old men and women plant trees whose shade they know they will never sit in. I thought it was an excellent debate started by the Cabinet Secretary, who stressed the importance of sustainable management of forests and new commissioning and funding uh, across the UK uh, to expand future timber. I also welcome the Strategic Timber Fund, and I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will say a bit more in the wind up on that issue. And if I picked him up correctly, I think a goal of more community ownership of around 700 acres was, was planned. I think Edward Mountain made an excellent speech as convener of the Recce Committee. It quite rightly talked about increasing the skills and keeping the skills of foresters. 
a long-term strategy with objectives and review, and more clarity around definitions. I did agree with the points that, that he made. I clearly also think, and a common theme among members, was let's get the IT systems right. How many times in this parliament have we touched on a new IT system that has failed? Let's get this right. And again, I thought Peter Chapman uh, made a number of points I would agree with about an amendment of the bill through the cross-border uh, work on tree health is vitally important. And a review of progress on planting expansion timescales must be uh, reported to parliament uh, at an appropriate stage. Uh, Rora Grant set the context of the uh, devolution of the Forestry Commission uh, and again a common theme was the important role of the creation of the Chief Forester role which will effectively fight the corner of foresters within the Scottish Government. But it's crucially important, as Rhoda Grant said, to look at the social economic role of forestry and the needs uh, uh, of local uh, community. Uh, Stuart uh, Stevenson, um, as always, was entertaining. Um, he talked about his time fighting the First World War, or maybe I misunderstood that, um, <laughs> about the, um, the important role of timber played in the, fir in the First World War, and made the inter interesting point that he counts as one and a half members within the SNP group, and no nobody in the Parliament has ever doubted his important role. Um, John Scott, I think, uh, quite rightly raised the points of having clarity um, over definitions uh, and looking at the definition of uh, community uh, bodies. So overall, uh, President Officer, I thought this was a first-class debate. And we know the big picture, that the forestry industry needs stability to allow it to invest and to grow, to ensure it thrives for future definitions. And it needs knowledge. And I would restate my earlier point. While civil servants are specialists in what they do, it's important the knowledge held by foresters within the current commission is not lost. So on behalf of the five trade unions that represents the Forestry Commission, I would appreciate the Cabinet Secretary could assure me that the skills of the Forestry Commission will be maintained and the unions representing the staff will be fully engaged uh, during the negotiations about all aspects of staff transfer. Labour's position uh, is clear. We support the general principles of the Forestry and Land Management Bill and I urge all members to support. Thank you. I now call Jamie Green. Around six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to close my party in this debate as a member of the Rural Economy Committee and also an MSP representing an area which contains valuable public forestry, especially on the Isle of Arran. I have a vested interest in the successful outcome of this bill. But it's also clear, listening from the speeches today, that there is still some work to do as this bill progresses through the Parliament. Uh, if I could first point towards the committee uh, recommendations, uh, which uh, include uh, a number of pertinent points. For example, the need for the Scottish Government to provide clarity on how it will administer its forestry functions. The proposal, for example, of the creation of a chief forester position, something that these benches support. That the bill should have an overarching aim, objective or indeed a mission statement. What should the bill seek to achieve and what should be the long-term outcome as a result of this organization. That the costs of the rebrand are minimized where possible and that the financial reporting and audit functions available to this parliament with the current bodies must carry forward with the new structure. Transparency must prevail, uh, scrutiny must be forthcoming and accountability must not be diluted as, as a result of this integration. Uh, my colleague Peter Chapman noted in his contribution today uh, the importance of ensuring that we work together with other parts of the UK to ensure the health of our trees and that the wealth of expertise within the current Forestry Commission is not lost with the implementation of this bill. David Stewart reiterated that point in his closing. Uh, it is welcome today to hear from the Cabinet Secretary that cross-border cooperation will continue in a formal setting. Uh, these benches welcome the constructive approach taken by all governments in this issue. But Mr Chapman also made a pertinent point around planting targets and our ability to meet future targets. As we know, planting targets have been missed every year since 2001. If we are to meet targets, then we must have an honest and frank debate on the planning process and the costs of planting. Uh, my colleague Finlay Carson highlighted in his speech two areas of concern which many members uh, spoke about today, the lack of clarity over key definitions and the expansion of uh, compulsory powers. Uh, I do hope that the government will take into account the constructive comments made both by the committee and individual members on some of those definitions. 
I also welcome the Cabinet Secretary's commitment to listening to the concerns over additional compulsory powers. Uh, Rhoda Grant made an interesting point in her speech around some of the scenarios uh, whereby these compulsory uh, purchase powers might be required, but it is our understanding that the government already has sufficient uh, compulsory purchase powers, which we are happy to roll forward from the 67 Act where relevant to forestry. However, the ambiguity and concerns over purchase for sustainable development must be taken into account. The committee, by majority, agreed on a position that no case had been made for additional powers. Mike Rumbles reflected this in his own comments too. Uh, my colleague John Scott warned uh, against this Parliament producing poorly drafted legislation. Now, I value his experience in scrutinising bills in this place, and I agree with the sentiment of his speech. But he also thanked the, uh, thanked the Forestry Commission for their hard work to date. I'm sure that's something we would all agree on. I'd like to turn briefly to some of the other contributions made in today's speech. Uh, to our huge surprise, Presiding Officer Stuart Stevenson delivered a fascinating insight into the history of forestry in Scotland. We were also reminded of his previous ministerial importance in this matter, and indeed in any matter. Uh, but we today learn that he is also worth 1.5 of a normal MSP, so we are indeed forever grateful for his enlightening and indeed inflated presence in the Parliament. Uh, he did make a very interesting point, uh, however, on the structure of Hollywood committees. Uh, my own experience of committees in the Scottish Parliament has been overwhelmingly positive. Uh, John Finney pointed out an interesting point on the needs of small businesses in the forestry sector, and especially those deriving social benefit from Scotland's forests. He seeks reassurances and confirmations that the grants will be protected, and it is uh, good to hear the Cabinet Secretary confirm that today. Uh, uh, my uh, committee colleague Gail Ross pointed out the huge amount of scrutiny that has gone into the bill at this stage alone, and thanks to the many stakeholders who have provided us fascinating evidence, I think is a testament to the scrutiny that this Parliament is giving to this bill, a bill which will ultimately see the dis disappearance of a well-respected body in Scotland's rural landscape. Um, unfortunately, uh, uh, not entirely consensual. Um, uh, I think uh, another committee colleague, John Mason, uncharacteristically, in my view, painted quite an unwarranted makeup of the Rural Economy Committee. Uh, to my knowledge, no member has a declared interest in forestry, and every member of the committee has approached this bill with nothing more than goodwill and good intent. I think the suggestion otherwise is quite churlish, in my view, and I hope he might reflect on his comments on that. Uh, Colin Smith uh, raised a valuable point on the creation of new national parks in the south of Scotland. I think that's something, uh, a, a debate which will no doubt uh, continue outside the remit of this bill. Uh, Angus MacDonald touched on the importance of uh, deer management in Scotland, again something we've talked about in great detail in this parliament, and made the point that as we create new woodland, and it is right to do so, we also increase, or may increase the deer population. Perhaps again, a debate for another day. If I may close by asking the Cabinet Secretary uh, to reflect on the following points. Let's address the issue of definitions in this bill. Let's create a bill that is watertight and completely lacks ambiguity. Let's take uh, heed the majority recommendation on compulsory pur purchase powers being excluded from this bill. Let's take on board our suggestion on a chief forester and the uh, role of that. Uh, let's ensure that the success of the Forestry Commission to date in Scotland it has much been its neutrality and its expertise, and we would hate to see this lost as these changes are implemented. The Forestry Commission Scotland brand is a strong one. I would implore the Cabinet Secretary to see if the UK body might allow that brand to continue under licence in Scotland. That may be something to consider. Uh, with billions of pounds of gross value at stake and the environmental and social benefits that Scotland's forests <coughs> bring, it is vital that any concerns raised today are taken on board uh, as we progress to stage two of this bill. Thank you. I now call Fergus Ewing. Around nine minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I've thoroughly enjoyed this debate. I think it's been an excellent debate uh, from across the chamber and very largely a, a consensual one, as Mr Green has uh, just said. And uh, a reference has been made to uh, Mr Stevenson's uh, contribution. Um, of course, it was Roald Dahl who, who wrote the series Tales of the Unexpected. And I often think that Mr. Stevenson's contribution are a sort of parliamentary equivalent of, that, uh, of those excellent fictional works. And today's episode, somewhat extended, I thought, seemed to concern uh, the, the great Michael. Uh, I thought he was maybe taking the Michael, but it was about the making 
of the Michael, but there was a point there, as always, and that was the huge importance of forestry throughout a number of centuries to Scotland, not just of late. Uh, and uh, I wanted just to say before going on to answer uh, as many of the key points as possible, uh, I'm afraid I can't answer them all, uh, but uh, I am uh, committed to and would like to take part in bilateral meetings with uh, representatives of each of the other parties prior to stage two, if they wish, in order to see if we can make progress prior to stage two. I find that a good way of working with colleagues and that my door is open. If you wish to take that offer, please do take it up uh, quickly. Um, I also hope that stage two can be a collaborative exercise working together to improve the bill and there, are a, a scope for, there is scope for improvement which I, I recognise, although I think it is uh, substantially sound. I want to re reply to I think some of the main points <coughs> and starting off with the organizational structures, and Rhoda Grant and many others raised this. The new structures, presiding officer, preserve the current distinction between Forestry Commission Scotland and Forest Enterprise Scotland. Uh, uh, and as I think Gail Ross clearly pointed out, that FCS is becoming a dedicated forestry division responsible for grants, regulation, support, and development. And Forest Enterprise Scotland, already presiding officer and an agency, is becoming the Forestry and Land Scotland, an executive agency of Scottish ministers, responsible primarily for management of Scotland's national uh, forest um, estate. David Stewart and Rhoda Grant uh, mentioned the importance of the staff, as did, did other members, I think, from the Conservative ranks as well. They are absolutely right. One of the pleasures I had over the summer was visiting all of the conservancies in Scotland. Uh, with senior representatives of the Forestry Commission, including Scotland's Forestry Commissioner, Joe O'Hara, who's here in the debate, the, listening to the debate this afternoon. And that allowed me to see it firsthand uh, just how dedicated the staff are and how they regard it as a calling, not just as a job, but a calling. Uh, and I hope I was able to provide some assurance and clarification about what we all want from this bill, which is greater accountability uh, transparency and greater focus, if I may say so, on forestry than has been possible when the uh, accountability is so diffuse at the current time. Uh, so I can, I'm very happy to confirm in response to uh, Mr. S Mr. Stewart and Ms. Grant in particular that the expertise will not lo be lost. The staff transfer to the Scottish Government will maintain the sc strong public sector role in forestry policy and delivery. We will minimise disruption to staff uh, and we will help ensure business continuity. And indeed, I have had numerous meetings, lengthy meetings, with the trade union representatives and they have been extremely productive. And I could also mention that the Cabinet Office Statement of Practice called COSOP applies when sta staff are transferred between civil service departments. Uh, so I, I mention that because it's important to uh, stress how we value the staff in the Commission and Forest Enterprise and the work that, uh, uh, that uh, they do. <coughs> um, we of course need to increase this, the pace and scale of tree planting to meet our ambitious annual planting targets. We are making good progress towards this. In response, uh, I think it was Mr Chapman who, or it could have been Mr Mountain, I'm sorry, about the speed and the process and the protracted nature of the process of obtaining permissions. Uh, we did address that, of course, by asking the former chief planner of Scotland, Jim McKinnon, to look at the whole process, expert as he is in that area. He came up with, I think, 21 recommendations, which we've accepted. They will all be implemented uh, or largely implemented by the end of this year. And I think there has been a substantial buy-in to the process that he set out. So I, I think that that progress has been welcomed. And Stuart Goodall said, I'm heartened to see pragmatic workable proposals to ensure we finally achieve the tree planting rates necessary to deliver the sector's full potential. Um, I would also point, point out that uh, Scotland uh, has in the last year been responsible for 70% of new tree planting in the whole of the UK. So whilst it's fair to point out as uh, members have done that we have not yet reached our target. I'm confident that we will do so fairly soon. And I know that because of the level of activity in nurseries, for example, where 
they have massively increased their stock with a view to greater sales. Uh, forestry is a long-term business. It's planned well, well ahead. And from my visits uh, to Christie's and Alba Nursery, for example, I know that they are planning for that future and we value their contribution there and end. Forest Enterprise is a very successful commercial organization. Its income amounted to 85 million in 2016. As well as timber sales, it sells venison. It has substantial income from renewable energy developments. It's built up a portfolio uh, and a very substantial income from that, which enables it to supplement its, uh, uh, its uh, Excuse its me, Cabinet activities. Secretary, could we have a bit of quiet on this side of the chamber, please? And could uh, everyone coming in and sitting down be aware the debate's still going on? Cabinet uh, Secretary. Uh, thank you uh, for resuming order, Presiding Officer. Um, uh, uh, not that I'd done anything to provoke this order, I hope, but, uh, but there we are. Um, now, I mean, the compulsory purchase powers we will certainly consider at stage uh, two, um, and uh, I am considering very carefully the comments received uh, from stakeholders, but also the contributions made today. Um, I would make the point, I think, that was made by, I think, by various uh, members, including uh, Mr. MacDonald, that the the fact that we have the power does not mean that it's necessary to use it to prove that it's necessary. In other words, it's wrong to infer that because the power hasn't been used since 1967, 50 years, that it's not necessary because it's a backstop. Uh, and I would caution that having a power of last resort can be valuable in bringing negotiations to a conclusion, even if the power is never used. I think I haven't time presenting off, so I'm very sorry. I we're very happy to meet Mr. Rumbles to have a lengthy discussion with him about that if he so uh, wishes. Um, I wanted to mention the... Uh, well, you know, I, I, take, I take on any task, no matter how challenging. Well, well I, I think I should be fair. Equal ops, i.e. No, no interventions. Very sorry, it's not personal, but very happy to meet again. Uh, I'm taking on all these challenging tasks, presiding officer. Uh, seriously, though, the, uh, the IT system was mentioned. Could I just stress that the IT system needed to be replaced anyway? Okay, so it needs to be replaced. However, we uh, are able to confirm and have done so that it, uh, the cost of that will not exceed the upper estimate in the financial memorandum. And also, I will, of course, update members as soon as there's further information. Equally, rebranding costs will be kept to a minimum. That is the approach that I'm taking <laughs> And I'm delighted to hear that's the approach taken today. Uh, definitions occupied quite a lot of time this afternoon, and they are important, I don't doubt that. Perhaps I could just point out to members, though, that the phrase sustainable development is generally well understood and widely used in legislation. In fact, it was no less a figure than the Lord President, Lord Gill himself, who said in the Park Judgment that, quotes, in my view, the expression sustainable development is in common parlance in matters relating to the use and development of land. It is an expression that would be readily understood by the legislators, the ministers, and the land court. So I think that the difficulties are perhaps not as acute as some may have said, but I'm very happy and undertake to consider that, uh, uh, that uh, further on. Much reference was made to timber transport uh, on rural roads. David Stewart referred to that. And by sea, and uh, John Finney quite rightly mentioned that, there's a no large number of examples where timber is taken by sea around the country, and that is a good thing. And I would also mention that rail freight, uh, where, it, where there are opportunities, is another equally important matter to which we are giving close attention. In conclusion, presiding officer, could I say that I thought David Stewart's contribution was excellent, uh, and he set out the historic context of what we're doing here. The Forestry Commission is 98 years old, I would add that it was Lord Lovett, who was the first chair of the Forestry Commission. Lord Lovett from the Highlands, an extremely distinguished man in many ways, and he's regarded as the father of the Forestry Commission. And I know that, presiding officer, because I read over the summer the history of the Forestry Commission in Scotland. And uh, that's just reminded me that I better give the book back to Joe O'Hara. So Joe, remind me to give you your book back because I finished it. Thank you. That concludes our Stage 1 debate on the Forestry and Land Management Scotland Bill. The next item of business is consideration of Motion 7872 in the name of Derek Mackay 
on a financial resolution for the Forestry and Land Management Scotland Bill. I would call on Derek Mackay to move the motion. Moved. Thank you very much. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 8719 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a revised business programme for tomorrow and Thursday. I would ask any member who objects to say so now. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 8719. Formally moved. Thank you very much. And no member has asked to speak against the motion. The question, therefore, is that motion 8719 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau motion 8738 on committee membership. Can I ask Joe Fitzpatrick once more on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau to move the motion? Moved. Thank you very much. We come to decision time. The first question is that motion 8677 in the name of Fergus Ewing on stage one of the Forestry and Land Management Scotland Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The next question is that motion 7872 in the name of Derek Mackay on a financial resolution for the Forestry and Land Management Scotland Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And the final question is that motion 8738 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau on committee membership be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We move now to members' business in the name of Daniel Johnson. And we'll just take a few moments for members to change their seats.